All right. Oh, geez. Let's change the camera a little bit here. Okay. There we go. Hello and good evening. We are back. We are talking opossum versus possum. And I just want to start off with that this is a viewer request. And I am be doing these every Friday. So if you guys want a certain subject picked out that you want to talk about, be it an animal or a uh, specific subject about an animal, let's have it. You can always message me through Twitch. Um, and I'm going to be trying to start up a Discord soon. So I'm hoping to get those rolling here eventually. So, um, starting off is the uh, rather known possum, or the opossum, sorry. I'm going to get myself confused on this because there's the colloquialism, colloquial terms of calling it a possum with a hard P, not an opossum. So here in North America, we only have the opossum, Didelphus virginiana. That is our Latin term of the Virginia possum, and that is what you find everywhere with the rat kind of face, the big teeth, uh, the rat tail. They look ugly. They absolutely look ugly as sin. Um, they look vicious. They're probably one of the most docile animals I encounter. Um, with the possum, they are omnivorous. They eat whatever's around, everything that's around, whatever they can find. They will eat uh, invertebrates, carrion, insects, well, those are technically invertebrates, uh, mollusks, um, they will eat ground nests of birds, like grouse, turkey, um, pheasant, and the like. Uh, they are known nest stealers, actually, so that's a pretty common thing for them. Uh, with the opossum, they are the... There's new study coming, there's a new research that's come out that says they are not the only marsupial in North America anymore. Not specifically them. Uh, they are the they are the most common marsupial that we have in North America. I got I found it while researching for these guys. I found it in my uh, diggings that something else out there might have genetic um, genetic tracings to another animal that does have marsupial like traits. So I'll probably dig into that another night. But yeah, we're gonna kick off with talking about the Virginia possum. Yes, this is a friend found. I found this. Uh, from a, um, one of my uh, wildlife forums. friend posted this when I was asking for some clarification on some information. He posted this, and you can just hear, you can hear that jingle in your head um, quite easily. So, but yeah, let's kick off with some of the information for the possum. Let me pull up my notes. Do, 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 do. Here we go. Okay, so yes, they are um, the main marsupial of North America, endemic only to us. Um, they are the largest order of marsupial in the Western Hemisphere. So you will only find this size of marsupial this side of the world. Um, they started originally down in South America and made their way up to North America based on the um, tracings that they've been able to find with other historical research. Um, Basically, they are, to quote Stephen Van Tassel, um, the wildlife control consultant, they are um, a trash, the four-wheel drive trash can of the animal world. They eat literally everything. They will eat um, roadkill. So that's why you'll often find them dead on the side of the road because they're going for what was already dead on the side of the road. They've learned that it's actually a pretty good spot to get food. So we can see them a lot in that area um a lot of them like i say it's just referred to as a possum that is not technically the name for them it's just what everybody calls them but the opossum is the technical name for them it actually comes from a um one of the older indian languages uh, called a possum uh, is what our uh, opossum is what they what they called it originally and we just made it opossum because basically the english language takes other languages down the back alley beats them up and takes their spare vowels to make languages out of it because that's what english does um in terms of uh evolution they are registered as what's called a living fossil 
they were considered that at least. There's another animal out here in the Pacific Northwest I deal with called the mountain beaver that has that same status as a living fossil. They just haven't changed in millennia in terms of their uh, or in terms of evolutionary standards. They can still find skeletal remains very close to this um, to what we have present day. So they just haven't changed for thousands of years. Um, but let's see here. There weren't a lot of them at the time, but they are all over the place now. And again, that's humans to blame. They will absolutely pilfer your dog and cat food. They'll eat whatever falls out of bird feeders. They are technically semi-arboreal. So arboreal means they live in trees. So being semi-arboreal means they'll live in trees sometimes. They have the ability to climb. One of the cool physiological features of an opossum is actually their back foot. Their foot doesn't look like a traditional foot. Their foot sits, I wanna make sure I'm making the thing. Their foot actually sits out like this. Like they have a thumb that sticks all the way off to the side. Or like more like that or actually more like that so it's it's a reverse hand almost for them but it's not technically a thumb it's just another toe that allows them to grip it's just it's one of the goofiest things you can never see uh, but that also makes tracking them very definitive on um, what the animal when it leaves its footprints in the dirt and the mud and the sand, it's very easy to see what it is that walks through there because of their splayed fingers and the back foot. The back foot is the biggest giveaway of their uh, um, foot, of their track patterns. And so there's another thing about marsupials that is true for all marsupials. Bifurcation. They have both males and females, either a bifurcated peni or vaginal opening. Yes, they have a double-headed dragon and a twin receiving sac. Yes, that is, yes, that is possums. That is marsupials in general. Uh, possums are very known for that. Um, possums also have one of the uh, largest, the most amount of teeth out of the North American mammals. They have, oh, where'd that, where'd that, where'd that go? Uh, they have 50 teeth. They have 50 teeth in their mouth. Whereas a human I couldn't find the notes, so I just did it. Humans only have 32. So they have almost twice as many teeth in their mouth than a human does. So they have the most amount of teeth than any mammal in North America. And that's, that's leave it to a possum. That, that's just something that they do. Um, they do have those really big canines on the front of their face. They're there for intimidation. The only time I've ever been bit or had somebody be bit by them, you stuck, you either grabbed it the wrong way or you stuck your finger in its mouth. And I'm not kidding, I had somebody do that on a dare. We then had to send the animal in for rabies testing, and it was unpleasant. Uh, uh, sexual dimorphism is not huge. Uh, males tend to be just bigger, heavier, and have larger canines. That's about it. So there's no big difference between the two. Um, they're fairly nomadic and solitary. Um, so long as there's food and water that's readily available to them, they'll stick around. That's pretty much the most that there is to it. Uh, their tails are um, mildly prehensile. As they get bigger, it's harder for them to use it because they just get bulkier. So their tails tend to make, they, they tend to just grab things as they need to, but they don't always hang by their tail, especially when they get bigger. Their, their body literally cannot support that. When they're little, yes. They will hang by their tail to do things. And yeah, there is the, the, you see the thing of the young hanging by their tails and sleeping at night, kind of like a bat does. Yes, they can do that. No, they don't do that all the time. Uh, but it's very common for juveniles because it's just a more safe area for them to get to. Uh, they will make a nesting location out of leaves, sticks, branches, 
garbage bags, plastic bags, whatever they can get their paws on, and they'll pull it into a den area and sleep on that. Um, see, vocalizations are kind of a gargling growl. It's it's more an intimidation thing and a little bit of a back off warning for an opossum, but it's not really um, it's not loud. It's more it's it's literally more like a growling gurgle. So they're not they don't bark. They don't really make a lot of noise. If they do, they're either really scared or just before they start playing possum, and we'll get into that in a minute. Um, before they start playing possum, or they um, they're either doing a little bit of like a smacking noise for um, drawing in females. It's kind of their mating call, as much as it is. Um, I'll talk to them. Their diet. They eat literally everything. Um, they have been found eating grain. Um, they do need a lot of calcium, so they will chew on bones is one of the things about the opossums as well. Okay, we got three people hanging out here. I want to see who's here. Uh, Britta, Diaper, and Lost Korokor. Hi guys, thanks for hanging out. I just always like to see who's here and who's hanging out. Since I have a much smaller crowd right now uh, in these iterations of my uh, talks, the early years I'll call this, um, it's easy for me to look and see who's here and give shout outs to everybody. Um, in terms of Relatives, yes, they're related to kangaroos. Yes, they are marsupials in that fashion. They are marsupials to that fashion that don't, doesn't mean they're a genetic beeline going right back to a kangaroo. Uh, one thing that's very interesting about them is they are practically immune to rattlesnake and pit viper venoms. Uh, and they regularly eat these kind of uh, snakes. Um, it's unique to this particular species. Um, the, the one of their close relatives, which is actually the brown four-eyed possum. Um, I'm actually going to pull up a picture here of that. These guys are down in South America, where they've all branched out from. Um, they are smaller. Um, they don't really have the physiological makeup the same way that the be that our Virginia possum does but there's several different possum species down in South America which is where they started from um, but they can take on most uh, venomous reptiles and I was doing some digging into that I thought it was really fascinating so about it there is um, there was a patent made for an anti-venom or anti-venom um, in 1996 for a person that found, uh, we're going to dig into a little bit of science here, that it was found based on a protein peptide chain. Peptides are the, um, uh, man, biology, you're escaping me here. Peptides and amino, amino acids are part of what work on a cellular level. A lot of the uh, way your body reacts to the hemotoxin and the neurotoxin, so the blood venom and the neurological damaging venom, are based off of how those peptides and amino acids react cellularly. So these snake or the the possums um, are practically immune to them because of these protein strains, and they've been working uh, to try to replicate and synthesize these proteins and the amino acids in order to actually um, make an all general antivenin using the possums. Or the opossum. So yeah, I'm gonna fault. I'm like I said, I'm gonna fault at this. Um, it was really cool because they've actually been trying to use this for areas because where a lot of the um, rattlesnakes and the big pit vipers are not in North America but in other countries that they've been trying to use it as an anti venom that can ship out to other areas. Um, let's see. This article was posted in 2015 and 20 years ago, or 10 years, 10 years, 20 years, there it is. The discoveries of the findings were made nearly 20 years ago by a researcher named Benny V. Lips. Let's see. Um, they are actually from uh, Bombay, so it's an Indian researcher. Um, oh, near Bombay, sorry, I want to correct myself there. Um, yeah, came to, um, 
just basically work really well with the sciences. Um, came to the United States in 1965. Um, I'm actually going to put a link about them in the uh, in the chat here. So if you guys want to check it out later, uh, I will make sure that that's there, and you guys can. Uh, I'll also, when I upload this to YouTube, I'll also make sure to save this um, save this file for them, so that way the correct researcher can be done. Uh, and I'm going to try to start saving a bunch of these different uh, articles so that I'd have them linked up and posted into um, YouTube. So, okay. So now, talked a lot about the opossum. Oh, wait, we got a couple more things to cover. Getting ahead of myself here. Uh, let's see here. So they, being marsupials, their gestation period, their pregnancy period, is actually incredibly, incredibly short. Um, they don't uh, have a pregnancy the same way that most mammals do, uh, whereas they gestate the fetuses very quickly, or at least not quickly, they don't maintain them in their body for very long. They are actually born at 12 to 14 days old, or at least at 12 to 14 days of uh, gestation. They then, and she can give, they can give birth to litters up to 20, can be born in their pouch at the same time. Um, the thing is, they, have, they are blind, sightless, and just can't figure anything out. So what they do is they have to climb in that pouch to try to find a teat for them to latch on, and they stay there for weeks after that. Um, they are weaned after 70 to 125 days, uh, but they can only... Uh, maintain 13 because opossums only have 13 nipples. What's the survival rate out of a group of say 12? Well that's pretty close because they have uh, up to 13 at a time. Um, average is you that's kind of dependent on the area as is with most things of nature uh, but usually anywhere from four to six will actually fully survive um, until they're able to become sexually mature. So that's why they have, with any animal, they give birth to so many because they don't last long. Just like frogs, they have hundreds of eggs with their tadpoles, and the tadpoles don't live very long. Same thing happens with these possums. They literally will have a juvenile, will fall off and fall out of the pouch and die. That just happens with nature. And that's, that's one of the reasons why they give birth to so many. And even then, they give birth to about 20 at a time, so that at least up to 13 can survive. So it's already in its own level of uh, <laughs> survival of the fittest. So after those thir after those 13 make it, there is the, there's there's round two, and if they can make it to the point that they become uh, sexually mature, they've lasted. And it's you it's pretty low, all things considered. The you the wild. A lifetime of these animals in the in the wild it's usually anywhere from one to three years they can be um, they can live beyond four years in captivity they've never they haven't studied exactly how long they'll live but like anything in captivity it can live a lot longer I would say up to ten years what is this word I don't know what this word is I don't know how to pronounce this, but for possums, okay, or this, I'm going to post the word here so see you guys can look it up too. Um, I'll have to figure out how to pronounce it later, uh, but biological aging, uh, which is the gradual deterioration of functional characteristics, opossums age incredibly fast. So it basically, they don't have extended lifetimes because they mature and they age so quickly. And part of that might be because of their um, beefiness, as like what I said with the, the venomous immunity. And that may be a factor in it. The other part might actually be the reason a lot of people say playing possum. Uh, opossum have this ability where it's non-voluntary. It's basically they get so stimulated to the point that they literally pass out. Uh, the actual term for this is thanatosis or tonic immobility um, it's a mimicry of death basically is what it is for possums 
they literally faint. Think like the fainting goats, um, where they just pass out and they can't function. Uh, with opossum, they'll also excrete this milky green fluid um, out of an anal gland that just stinks. It makes it smell and seem like they smell like that they're dead. Uh, you can poke them, flip them over, rustle them around a little bit. They won't respond. That is that is the opossum playing dead. This flat out dead. So that's what these guys will end up doing. And it's usually just they'll be there until whatever is bothering them leaves. And so we try to make sure uh, whatever I deal with them, I don't let them get to the point where they actually pass out because I've gotten this ooze on me. I can only call it ooze because it's green and it stinks. Uh, it does not come out of clothes very well, like at all. I had a single pair of pants that I washed three times and I basically threw them away. Um, they don't know when to wake up. It's basically what their body deems is long enough to reset. So you can stare at them for a while. I'll have to see how long. That is something I didn't look up. Oh, it can last up to four hours up to four hours from the very mild uh <laughs> from the very mild observations i've done it could be anywhere from 15 minutes to half an hour uh that's just from what i've encountered but it can last up to four hours um i mean i want that napping ability i'll take it i mean most of the time i hit the bed and i just pass out and i'm done <laughs> ask my ex, ask my ex, any of them, they'll know. Uh, but that is usually more for. There's a lot of other creatures that will that have this ability of thanatosis. Um, uh, it is found in uh, some shark species, like the white tip dogfish and lemon sharks. Uh, tiger sharks will do. Will get tonic immobility. Um, it has to do with the snout, messing with their snout. It basically, and there's a guy that did this on Discovery, where a shark came up, he put his hand on its snout and then pushed it away, and the shark just kind of flopped backwards in the water, right itself and then swam away. So it's messing with that on a shark. Uh, there's several fish species that'll do it, uh, reptiles. Uh, iguana have been known to do this, along with the Carolina anole. Um, there was a single rabbit study done to find the rank between fear-motivated stress and some of the psychological, no, physiological responses induced by tonic immobility. What happened to rabbits? Um, chicken hypnotism. Ducks. Um, humans have has been hy uh, hypothesized that humans undergo intense trauma um, can go into tonic immobility. Um, a lot of beetle species will do it. The hognose snake. Oh, the drama queen of the hognose snake. If anybody here ever watches Snake Discovery, they breed hognose snakes. They are gorgeous animals. They're really cool people. Um, they uh, have hognose snakes, and they've had them do this. Well, they will intentionally let flop on their back, mouth open, and they'll excrete uh, an ooze like a musk and they'll do it too but if you try to flip them over the they just flip right back up showing like showing their belly saying oh i'm dead and even if you flip them over they stay dead so <laughs> um there is a, a brown widow spider will do that too um some other spider species will do it too when being shaken out of their webs I mean, yes, when all else fails, feign death. Oh, that reminds me of a, um, an article that I'm sure everybody's at least heard of. There was a kid up north. I want to say it was either Canada or northern Michigan. Um, him and his sister were out in the woods by a river or by a lake. And 
you there they came across a moose now and it was rut season when this happened so rut makes them incredibly aggressive especially the males what ended up happening that's the the bull saw them and started charging them and the kid basically played dead he feigned death and he, he would wait until the moose started walking away then he'd get up get closer to his sister and then he faint he'd play dead again he'd, pa- he'd make it look like he passed out to the moose and he did that until he got him and his sister completely away from the animal so I, that was one that was smart but the funniest part was he equated it to his world of warcraft hunter that played that he could do feign death on the hunter and that's what his inspiration was to keep the animal from attacking him i thought that was glorious so anyway we're getting off on a tangent here um i think i have everything covered with possum except for two things um there's been a lot of talk about opossums being resistant or immune to rabies and i want to be very clear things can be resistant but they are not immune all warm-blooded mammals can contract rabies no questions asked hard stop that's it plain as day all warm-blooded mammals can contract rabies now just because some you have never seen certain animals become positive for rabies doesn't mean they've lasted long enough to be taken and studied because with small animals like squirrels or rats they can't contract rabies they just die very quickly from the rhabdovirus and we can make that a whole talking point there's so many things we can discuss and talk about for um, rabies studies and things that are different there have been rabid beaver actually rabid beaver have existed and have attacked humans that does happen reminder drink your water if you got your water nearby drink it okay um the other and i touched on this before oh kurt's not here so of course he wouldn't he would he would get to miss out on my rant for this whole thing um there was a study done about possums and ticks where there's been a whole thing about possums eating ticks and they are a natural control method for ticks so here's basically what happened there was a study done um, about tick drop-off rate that's how ticks get moved around the world is they land they like latch onto something they feed they get enough blood they fall off and that's it and then they lay their eggs and then it just starts over from there um, I'm exaggerating or I'm, I'm I'm cutting this the tick biology very short the whole point is focusing on the possums and why this is a problem so with the possums there was a study done where they inoculated possums with ticks not just the opossum like oh my gosh i keep saying possum opossum the opossum didelphus virginiana the virginia possum was inoculated with ticks along with other species of animals in this study uh one was a want to say the white-footed deer mouse a striped chipmunk and two bird species were all done at the same time and then if they were inoculated and evaluated for how many ticks fell off after feeding and based on that study they found the opossum had the least amount of drop-off main reason they're able to groom their body better than any of those others they can pull the ticks off and they will eat the ticks so the speculation was based on the rate of inoculation and how few fell off possums could eat several thousand ticks in a year okay so if you don't understand the science and what it's speculating versus what actually happens there's a problem where people take the information and don't understand it the proper way what this was saying is that possums are good at grooming not that they are a way of controlling ticks ticks are everywhere they just are i mean we don't have them so much here in western washington but they just they're here they are around they'll be a problem with um this study people are now taking it that possums are the best thing in the world they're great for lyme disease control which yes we need to work on lyme disease control but there are products and other ways of dealing with it out there 
chickens do better at controlling ticks than an opossum ever will. That's just it. That is an absolute fact. Um, because with the possum, it is big on their grooming. They just have the ability to pluck them off and eat them when they're doing it. Because they're an animal that is so close to the ground when they're walking, they're short, they're stubby, um, they can groom themselves more often and be in that environment. So people think because they are a magnet for ticks, they're great for tick control. That is not the case. If a possum lived off of ticks alone, it would die. Just simple as that. They are just good at cleaning themselves. That's it. Okay, so that was my whole rant about <laughs> the tick study. Possums are neat. They're one of the weirdest animals I deal with, and they're really cool. But don't start about ticks. So now we're going to switch to the other possum, specifically the bush-tailed possum down in Australia, the home of the marsupials. You can see he's here on the left, whereas a Dodelphus virginiana is on the right. So these guys are much smaller. Um, where did it go? Stop that. Stop, stop, stop that. Oh my gosh. Ugh. So the most often one seen down there is the common brush tail possum. Uh, they are from Australia originally. They're not incredibly large. Um, what do they have these here? Oh, kilograms. They're one, one, to, one to five kilograms. So that is very small, just a few pounds. Um, a little smaller than the Dodelphus virginiana, which can get 20-ish pounds at the most. These guys are a lot smaller, usually in the 10 to 15 range. Um, they are also semi-arboreal. Um, they also are uh, omnivorous. They'll eat everything too. But they will predominantly stick with plants. <coughs> uh, they have the ability to digest eucalyptus, um, like with a lot of the other... Oh, good grief. Body, stop reacting to things. Um, but they will eat a lot of plant life. They are actually become a huge problem uh, in different residential areas, like with everything. Um, if it's not managed properly, it becomes a problem. Um, it is the most widespread marsupial of Australia, found on both sides and top and bottom of the continent. Um, they were brought up to New Zealand in the 1850s because a, just like with the nutria, it's all about fur. They were trying to make a fur industry out of the bush-tailed possum, or brush-tailed possum. And the problem was, one, the first group that they were brought over there didn't survive. They didn't last long um, because of the environment, whereas um, they are brought over again in... The first opossum population to thrive was in 1858. That's thriving. And then by the 1950s, they were declared a complete pest, where they were just destroying the plant life. And we're talking not the thousands, but by the 1980s, there were anywhere from 50 to 70 million brush-tailed possums in New Zealand. Now, I don't know if you know how big New Zealand is, Koalas can only eat eucalyptus. Let's do a quick check on that. Um, I'm not sure if that's exclusively what they eat, but they predominantly will eat eucalyptus. They eat a variety of them, um, but it looks like it's predominantly the eucalyptus tree. Well, it's predominantly, but they'll eat a couple other trees, that whatever's available to them as well. Um, that could be another subject for us to uh, touch on. Oh, yay. I could have used this other article earlier. Uh, I'll touch back on this in a little bit with you guys. So, it some I had somebody send me another article. I put a post up asking for more articles about venom resistance on the um, possums. 
to kind of get all the information I can from other folks. And somebody just sent me a new uh, article, so I'll check that out here in a minute. Uh, let's see, where was I with this? But yeah, uh, New Zealand New Zealand is, let's see here, 130,000 square miles. So what is that, what is that akin to? Okay, let me put it this way. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I have something. Texas, the state of Texas is 268,000 square miles. So you have, in a country less than half the size of Texas, there are 50 million brushtail possum living in this country. That is absolutely insane. Because as a point of reference, the human population in Texas is 30 million. That's the entire state of Texas is 30 million. Let's try some. Let's try a state that's a little smaller. Let's try. Let's try Illinois. Okay, Illinois is a little smaller. There's 57,000 uh, square miles. So let's do. Oklahoma, we're getting closer, 70,000 70, square miles. So somewhere in a state between Oklahoma and Texas is where we're looking at for a size of this country. The country of New Zealand is only that big. It is, it is so small. It is 103,000 square miles. That is not big. And possum are thriving on this land. They actually opened up a bounty for these things, just like they did with Nutria down in Louisiana. They opened up bounties on these things for people to go out there and trap, hunt, shoot, whatever's needed to try to cull and control this population, which is insane that there's so many of them. Um, with their... Uh, da, 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 da. So their tail is fully prehensile. So they can use it um, just like a typical um, an ape can or a monkey can. There's a difference between the two. Um, it is, it's thicker, there is, it is fully furred except for the very bottom, which is where they grasp things. Um, they're not very large animals. Maybe, again, just a touch smaller than the opossum. With the tail, they're about 30, 28, 30 inches. Um, the Delphus virginiana, they are the same size. That is the opossum here in North America. So they're a little smaller. They're a little leaner than our chunky boy possums. That's what ends up happening with that. So um, so they can get to more places because they're more, they are semi-arboreal as well, but they can climb better than the um, the Duffles Virginiana. Um, some of their po some of their uh, predators naturally are foxes, dogs, cats, goannas, um, large snake species, and owls. Predominantly, will get them. Um, New Zealand, they are the biggest predator or the biggest um, predator in New Zealand. They eat the eggs, they eat the birds, they eat insects, they eat everything. Um, they will strip plants, they will strip gardens, um, because they are more of an herbivorous animal down there. But they are more arboreal than ours will. Um, they do have vocalizations, a little more than ours do. Uh, clicks, grunts, hisses, uh, chatters, and a cough, and some screeching. So they can do a little more than ours. Ours are just so freaking dopey. I'm sorry. I just find our, our opossum to be so dopey of an animal. <laughs> uh, but the big thing is is that um, they're, they're, the bigger problem with them is that they're just, there's too many of them 
in New Zealand. They're fine to be in Australia because they actually have. Um, what is this? Exudative derma dermatitis? Oh. So it's a skin infection. Greasy, greasy pig disease. These guys can actually get this. Um, exudative ep dermatitis. Huh. I just saw this on one of their pictures. Um, it usually comes from overcrowding um, and a lot of regular combat with other other species. It's a big skin infection that they can get, and there's a picture of one uh, with it on its face, like right at, right at the bridge of its nose between the eyes. It's just a big pustule of the infection is there. Um, but yeah, these the big thing that with the uh, possum, the brush-tailed possum being on New Zealand. The bigger issue with them is the creatures that are already in trouble without their problem. Um, that is like the kiwi. Everybody loves a kiwi. The flightless bird that they that New Zealanders call themselves. They call themselves kiwis because of that. There's also the fruit named after the kiwi or called the kiwi because of the bird. Um, there's a harrier hawk, a fantail, mutton bird, and a tui. I don't know that one. Um, they will also eat nectar and berries that native birds will re rely on. And the biggest, most dangerous problem with these brush-tailed possums, they can carry tuberculosis. Yes, bovine tuberculosis, which was spread to cattle, and it is terrible. Um, every year, New Zealander farmers lose about $35 million dollars to this tuberculosis. The government alone every year spends about 110 million on trying to control these animals because they're just so out of control on their population. And that's that's our fault, yet again, as humans. Uh, we brought them somewhere they didn't belong and we tried to make them do things they weren't supposed to do. I mean, yes, they are absolutely adorable. I will not deny that things look adorable. <laughs> and you can actually see, um, the, basically take that whole section between where the eyes and the button of the nose, that whole patch of skin right there, um, was just a big pustule from the dermatitis that this guy had from being in a fight with another one. Um, they can absolutely look adorable, but that doesn't change the fact that they're being a huge problem. And this is where management comes in. I am all about management. So long as we can manage the situation that we controlled, that's all it really comes down to. Okay, so that's pretty much it for um, talking about the opossum versus the possum or the brush-tailed possum. So we have the Delphus virginiana on the right, and the brush-tailed, or the common brush-tailed possum on the left. So that kind of shows you they are both marsupials. They both have the name possum, but when somebody talks about the opossum, they're talking about our white-faced, gray-bodied, rat-tailed kind of uh, possum. And then there is the brush-tailed possum down in uh, the Australian area that has invaded New Zealand because of us on the left. And they have the cuter visage of more fur, uh, more fur tail, and the greasy pig disease. Yes, the greasy pig disease. That is, uh, that one kind of surprised me. I was, I've, and through all my research, I'm surprised I missed that, but that is one of the, the, the diseases that they can contract. Um, the other is, like I said, that tuberculosis. The tuberculosis is a big one, and that's something that can potentially become a zoonotic where it may mutate to the point that it will infect people. And that is a whole discussion on itself. So I appreciate you guys. We're at the 45 minute mark and I think this is a good point to end it. Um, Tuesday, Tuesday we will be talking about 
mountain beavers. Mountain beavers is the other one I was talking about that is noted as a living fossil. So we will be talking all about that on Tuesday, 6 o'clock West Coast time. Tune in. I'll be here. You'll be there. And we'll talk about the mountain beaver. But have a good night, all. Make sure you drink your water. And I'll see you again.